Let us worship God. In Hosea 10, we read, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness upon you. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace towards us. We confess to you our sinfulness and sins and ask that you would forgive them in Christ's name and for his sake. For in him we have our redemption and we place our trust in his work upon the cross and in the fact that you raised him from the dead and we know that he has ascended and reigns with you forever. Lord Jesus, in you we put our hope. Be with us today by your Holy Spirit. Teach us from your word. Build us up in the message of your grace. To the glory of your Son. Amen. This morning comes from Acts 20 and reading from verse 17. Let us hear God's word. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he brought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. 
even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be in your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. May God bless this reading of his word to our hearts and our minds. Amen. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we pray concerning the situation at the moment with COVID-19. We pray for all those who are suffering loss from this illness or from others. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving, for those who are frustrated by the situation of not being able to have the remembrance of their loved ones that they want. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that in the midst of these things you would bring comfort and healing to heart and to mind. We pray too, Lord, that you would help us to be able to find solutions and treatments for COVID and for other illnesses. Lord, help us also to care for those who are suffering, to help them in the midst of it and to encourage them. We pray, Lord, for those who are working in our hospitals, in our medical care services, and also in all our emergency services at this time. We ask, Lord, for your grace to be upon them and that you would encourage them and keep them going in the midst of difficulty. We ask, Lord, that you would bring them moments of joy and refreshment and that they might also have the rest at the times that they need it. We pray, our Heavenly Father, for your church and ask that you would help us as your people to so live out your reign in our own lives that we spread that message of grace and love through our words and our actions, especially at this time. Help us, Lord, as those who believe that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Help us as those who trust in you and know that you have your hand upon all things. Help us, Lord, to be those who act and walk and live with faith and trust. And forgive us, Lord, for the times when we become down ourselves and forget your endless grace towards us. Heavenly Father, strengthen and build your church here and across the world. We pray too, Lord, for businesses, for jobs and for livelihoods. Heavenly Father, in the restrictions that come, it is hard for businesses to keep going. And so we pray for your blessing that we will come through this and come out of it and that people will be able to live and, and provide for themselves and their families. We do pray, Lord, for our families and for our schools and our children as they go back uh, to school uh, this week. And we ask, Lord, for their well-being and health and safety. And Lord, we pray that you would lead and guide us as we go about our business to bless our families, to encourage one another and to help one another. Lord, we pray for all those who are grieving at this time. We have seen attacks in France and we see the conflicts of the world elsewhere. And we long, Lord, for these things to come to an end. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, so orchestrate things among the minds and hearts of leaders and those with influence, that people are able to be protected and live, live safely, and that we might be able to walk humbly and bless one another. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for those in sorrow, that their sorrow might be lifted. 
We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit's work in convicting the world of sin and of our Saviour Jesus, that we might all come to know him. We ask, Lord, that you would do this in Jesus' name and to his eternal glory. Amen. Build yourselves up in the message of his grace and run the race. In this passage that we've been reading, we learn why Paul was in his hurry to go to Jerusalem and to Rome. He is following God's lead and he knows that he will not return again to Ephesus. So he sends for the elders of the Ephesus church which will be such a vital church in the coming centuries. He calls for them with one last word and message. And we should pay attention to that message. Paul would have considered this his message to the future church. And therefore, this is his message to us. First of all, Paul reminds them of the way of his life and his mission. And he returns to that same theme at the end. He makes these points. He was humble among them, not proudly calling them to follow him, but strenuously calling them to turn from sin to God and trust in Jesus. Secondly, he reminds them that he told them all of God's will and plan regarding the kingdom of God. And thirdly, he points out that he worked for his own living and did not seek money from them, not for himself, nor for anyone involved in the mission with him. He reminds them that in everything he did, he had a single purpose, that they should understand the full will of God. Paul says these things with a purpose. He isn't justifying himself. He is reminding them of how he and his fellow missionaries have acted so that they can compare it in the future with the intentions and actions of those he will call savage wolves. He is going to warn them about the savage wolves who are to come, and they will have a very different intention and so have very different actions in the church. Why is Paul telling them this now? Well, because he will not be able to tell them face to face ever again. This is his last meeting with them. He says he is not sure what is going to happen to him in Jerusalem. He knows something will. It seems at this stage that Paul is not clear upon the details, but he knows from God that prison and hardships await him. God has been telling him this in each city, reinforcing it, not to daunt him, but to steel him against what is coming. We must listen to God. We must listen to God and what he is telling us. Paul was listening to God, and he knew, therefore, some of what lay ahead of him. But that was little concern to him compared to his concern for the kingdom and the church of God. His concern for the church leads him to these elders of the church and how he he tells them how he, in his work and mission, puts his conscience at rest as regards his mission. And he does this again as an example to them and as a warning. Paul puts his own heart at rest for his part in the work in this. He has not hesitated to tell them the whole will of God. We hardly think of it quite like that. We hardly think that our reluctance or our hesitation and sharing about Jesus Christ is actually withholding from some lost soul the very means of their escape from their sorrows and their struggles. Paul was commissioned by Christ to tell the Gentiles the message of Christ and of his kingdom. And this Paul has done. If some did not respond, at least for his part he had done as he was commanded. And he has fulfilled his commission for his part. Have you? 
For your part, have you run your race, run your mission? You can still your heart by doing your part. And while not everyone bears the same commission as Paul, we each have our own. When Paul writes and speaks of running this race, this is what he means. He means doing the work God has set for you. We do not have Paul's commission. He was apostle to the Gentiles, and we are not. So what is your part in your commission? We must listen to God. It is not some general call to evangelism. The general call to evangelism is real, and we must do that, but it is not what Paul means. Paul is explaining to the Ephesian elders what it is that he means. It is the way he lived. It is the way he listened to God. It is the way he traveled as God directed. It is the life he lived and the message he spoke. It is the purpose that drove him. It is his whole life, including the journey he was now taking to Jerusalem and to Rome. Your life is your mission. Everything that God has called you to is your mission for him. I cannot run your race, nor you run mine, and they are not the same. It is in the midst of the living that we work out our salvation with reverence and trembling. I wish I could fully impress upon our hearts and minds that to God nothing is little, nothing is wasted, and what he is doing in us will be greater, the greater miracle than all he does through us. It's hard to explain to a world consumed with a desire to change the world that the kingdom of God is not a thing you do to the world. It is the reign of God in you just you. The reign of God in what you think of as your little life. The reign of God in what you think of as your little life. But if your life is filled with the reign of God, then there is nothing that is little about it. Run the race given to you. Paul then turns to the role of the elders he is speaking to. And he tells them to keep watch. First, they are to keep watch over themselves. And you know that bit can be easily missed. Paul does say to the elders that they should keep watch over the flock, but first they must keep watch over themselves. It is not their flock, and they are not different from it. Christians, Jesus told us this too. We must remove the plank from our own eye before helping our neighbor with the speck in his. We must abide in Christ ourselves, for without him we can bear no fruit for him. This is important in what Paul is telling them, for he says that even from their own number men will arise to distort the truth. Now remember what he has said to them. He was humble among them, not proudly calling them to follow him, but strenuously calling them to turn from sin to trust in God through Jesus Christ. He told them all God's will and plan regarding the kingdom of God. He worked for his own living and did not seek money from them. His single purpose was that they should understand the full plan of God. Now do you see Paul was giving them an example of how to watch over themselves. Watch yourself first. You will then be able to help others. Paul then tells them to watch the flock, that is, the fellow Christians for whom they have been appointed as elders. They are to act as shepherds. And the picture of the shepherd is used throughout Scripture And Jesus, of course, is spoken of as the good shepherd. But some of the role of shepherds in the ancient Near East may be lost to us. So here is what that role entails. The primary role was to protect the sheep from wild animals. And this fits with Paul's message to the elders and his warning about the coming wolves. 
The second role of the shepherd was to lead the sheep to pasture so they could feed. This fits with Paul's statement about telling the whole will of God. That is how Christians feed. They are told the whole purpose of God in the kingdom. Paul's own example then is what he calls these elders to follow, to concern themselves with the message and keep the flock from those who would distort the message. He reminds them that the Holy Spirit has called them to that work and that the church belongs to Christ. The church is bought with his blood and elders are the servants of Christ in the Holy Spirit like every other Christian is the servant of Christ in the Holy Spirit. They have their own call, these elders, and they have their own race to run. And then Paul states his main concern. He has been told by God that after he is gone, savage wolves will come in among the church and not spare the flock. And he spells out what he means. People will come uh, from outside the church and even from inside it, and they will distort the message. They will distort the message so as to build a following for themselves. And following those leaders, people will not realize that they have stopped following Christ. And here is the whole thing that we need to grasp. God's kingdom is not the organization of the church. God's kingdom is what we have been uh, seeing through the whole of the book of Acts. It is the Holy Spirit's work as he convinces people of their sins and of their Savior. It is the salvation of the individual who then takes Christ as king and lives out the reign of God in their life as their mission for him. It is all those who are doing this, united by the Holy Spirit and his leading. It is, in that sense, an invisible kingdom. That is why Paul did mission in the way he did. He did it in humility. He asked no money. He did not try to build a personal following, and he warned people against following him or following Apollos or following anyone else. He regarded the other apostles highly, but he was unafraid to rebuke them like Peter, if Peter got it wrong. Paul knew what the kingdom people are. They are people bought by the blood of Jesus for him. They are his alone, called by Christ, saved by Christ, and kept by Christ. That is why he was humble among them and worked among them, simply fulfilling his race and commission among them. Paul understood what the kingdom of God is. The savage wolves that were coming would not understand. They would think they knew best, and it was for them to rule the roost, to draw followers. They would build their own kingdom and call it the kingdom of God. Can you tell the difference? The difference between the one who wants you to follow them and the one who wants you to follow Jesus. The difference between the one who wants you to do something they want and the one who wants you to be a free member of God's kingdom running your own race before him. Can you tell the difference? Here is how you tell the difference. You be a free member of God's kingdom. That is how you tell the difference. You abide in Christ yourself. You keep watch on yourself. No one can lead you astray if your eyes are upon Christ. And so Paul says, I commit you to God and the word of his grace. You see, you build yourself up in the word, the message of his grace. You build yourself up in the message of his grace. If you want to be in his kingdom, know what the kingdom is, learn from the scriptures and understand and come to understand more and more and more and more deeply what the kingdom of God is and his reign in you personally in your life, and work out that reign of God in your life with fear and trembling. 
for life can be tough. You entrust yourself and your life to Him. You run the race, the mission life that He has given to you. You build yourself up in the word of His grace. You entrust your life and yourself to Him. The message Paul gave to the elders from Ephesus is for us. We must build ourselves up in the message of God's grace. We must run our race considering our life not for us, but for our King. God grant us grace and his Spirit that we may do so. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we bless you that in you we are brought into the kingdom of your Son, which is life and grace and peace. Help us to sincerely study your word, to understand it, reveal yourself in it to us, and help us, Lord, to follow you as we ought. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. Words of power strong to save that will never pass away. I will stand on every promise of your word. For your covenant is sure. And on this I am secure, I will stand on every promise of your word. When I stumble and I sin, condemnation pressing in, I will stand on every promise of your word. For you're faithful to forgive, that in freedom I might live. I will stand on every promise of your word. Guilt to innocence restored, you remember sins no more. I will stand on every promise of your word. When I'm faced with anguish choice, I will listen to your voice. I will stand on every promise of your word. Through the dark and troubled land, you will guide me with your hand. I will stand on every promise of your word. And you've promised to complete every work begun in me. I will stand on every promise of your word. Hope that lifts me from despair, love that casts out every fear. I will stand on every promise of your word. Not forsaken, not alone, for the Comforter has come. I will stand on every promise of your word. Grace sufficient, grace for me, grace for all who will believe. I will stand on every promise of your word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.